All right. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to go back and look at what we did last time, and we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about the stuff in detail. I, I kind of put that example up there fairly quickly um, without uh, really explaining all of it. I, some of the things I just said, yeah, well, this is what you do without really talking about it. So what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of rewind a bit and, and talk about the whys of the stuff that we did last time. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I want to make clear from the start is that um, web development has both a technical and a design aspect to it. The technical aspect is learning the tags and learning how the tags work and when we learn CSS, learning how CSS works and learning the language of uh, languages of web development. That's the technical side. But just as important, there is what I would call the design side of web development. And uh, the design side relates to the appearance of the page, but it really means more than that. A lot of people get hung up when they talk about uh, web page design, talking about pages that look really nice. And to be sure, that's an aspect of web design. Of course you want the page to look good. You know, you want it to be appealing and present a good image of your organization. But more so than the appearance, web design to me relates to um, creating uh, pages that, that really satisfy the needs of the users and that are easy for people to navigate through and find the stuff that they're interested in. Because face it, people don't go to web pages to admire how pretty they are. People go to web pages to get some information. And regardless of how it looks, if it's obscure and it's really difficult to find what you're looking for, then the web page isn't valuable. So right from the start, I like to emphasize the sort of the dual nature of, of web development. Now, early on in the game, we are we're, we're for the first assignment or so, we're only going to really talk about HTML. So um, we might get into a little bit of CSS either today or Tuesday of next week. But um, so the designs that we're going to have are going to be very limited at first. Remember, the HTML is the content of the page, so our focus is on creating the content of the page. The CSS provides the appearance and the layout, so that's sort of on the back burner for a while. But still, when I, I want you to think of design in the larger sense of thinking through what you need to do and coming up with a page that has the appropriate content and satisfies the needs for the users. So therefore, again, um, the first assignment. You might say there's not much design in that, and there isn't much visual design on that, but there is some planning, right? I've given you like five top or five topics, three topics that I wanted you to find some information on. Um, I was thinking HTML5, and so five came out. I can't think of one number and say <laughs> another number. That, that's tricky. But at any rate, um, I gave you three topics. There's the design phase for this one would be to research them and to find out a little bit about each of them and plan what you're going to say and then plan on what tags of the ones that we've used you're going to use to represent that data. And that's the design. Now as the course progresses and we get more and more uh, into the class, there'll be more things that we can do visually to, to help things uh, stand out on the page, to focus the user's attention, to give them visual cues on how to navigate the page and so on. But again, I do want the design and technical aspect to be stressed as both important right from the word go. All right, with that in mind, we're going to look at the page that we did last time, and we're going to make some ob observations and, and, and review some of the material. to review an angel where this stuff lives. <coughs> Each week there will be a folder and the lectures and the example files are in the folder. Now, um, I've had some students say sometimes that, um, online students say that it's hard to read the board 
And, and that's why I post the example files too. So if you're watching a video, you can actually have sort of the finished version of it. Uh, and, and hopefully that will help, help some of the problems that you have reading the material. At any rate, let's pull up the example that we had last time. All right. You do have to pull it out of the compressed file or the zip file in order for it to work completely properly. I've had, some, I've had students with questions about after they zip up their, their files not being able to see images on a web page. You can't view your web page inside a compressed file. You have to expand it first. So, and anyhow, here's a page that we did. And if you remember, there's two ways that we can view this page. There's two ways we're going to be viewing it. One is the way that our users are going to be viewing it. In other words, if we made this page live on the internet and a user browsed to that page, this is what they'd see. Try that again. Okay, I'm going to open it up the other way. I'm going to open it up in Notepad to see what's going on here. I have to pick all files again, remember? And I'll pull that up. Ah, interesting thing. You see, I couldn't plan for this, and I couldn't plan a better example than this. In fact, let's rewind. I did plan this example. All right, this wasn't an accident. All right. Notice something about the title line. And a number of students had this problem in lab. There's no end title tag there. All right? Start tag, end tag. There should be. Because every starting tag should have an end tag. But I forgot to put the uh, end tag in there. Well. You also didn't put an end tag on the second paragraph. Yeah. Oh. This one I didn't. All right. So, but if I remember right, the page displayed correctly last time. I'm guessing because I used Google Chrome. Or not. Hmm. All right. At any rate, there should be an end tag here. If you break the rules of HTML, the browser takes its best shot at what it thinks that you mean. It's kind of like if you gave someone a note, but you really spelled the words bad. Depending on how badly you spelled the words, maybe the person could still figure out what you meant. Or maybe the person would just have to guess and would guess wrong. Go to the store and get some, you know, G, D, E, F, Y, 2, 7, you know. Person has no idea they're gonna have to guess what, what, what they think you mean. Whereas if you spe spelled carrots a little bit wrong, maybe they could figure out you wanted carrots. So, if you break the rules of HTML, each browser is gonna take its own guess at how it should display. And I thought last time when I displayed this in Google Chrome, it worked, but it doesn't seem to be the case now. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, because I put the end title tag on there. All right. So, be sure, and this, this will be less important at the beginning of the semester and more important towards the end of the semester as we start doing more involved things. It's important to test your page in a variety of different web browsers. All right. Um, it's also important that you follow the rules for tags. And let's review the rules for tags uh, again. First off, we have this at the beginning that isn't really a tag, but it's called the doc type. And that simply tells the browser what version of HTML we're going to be using on this page. This actually means that we're going to be using HTML5. 
All right, and it might not be obvious, but th that's what it means. All right, there are other doc types for other versions of the language that that if you look at earlier web pages will look a little bit different than that. So that should be at the front of that should be the first line of every web page. The HTML tag, again, may seem redundant, but it's also needed. It tells a browser that this is indeed an HTML page. HTML pages are divided into two sections. They're divided into a head section and a body section. Anything that you want to appear on the web page itself, like any of this stuff, should be in the body section. What's in the head section is information about the page. So initially, the only thing we're going to put in there is the title. Later on, we're going to put some other stuff too. But keep in mind that if it's content that you actually want to appear in that window, it should be in the body section. Now, notice again that each starting tag, after I corrected the problem with the title tag, each starting tag has a corresponding ending tag. They come in pairs. All right. This says where the tag starts, the starting tag. This indicates where it ends. So this is the start of the head section. This is the end of the head section. This is the start of the body section. This is the end of the body section. This is the start of my second level heading. This is the end of it. So it's just like it with a highlighter. You know, if you marked up a book, you'd put a circle around it. You'd show where the important stuff started and where it ended. Same thing here. That's where the headline starts. That's where the headline ends. All right. That's where the paragraph starts, that's where the paragraph ends, and so on. So there's a handful accept of exceptions, but for the most part, every start tag has an ending tag. All right. Second thing is, tags should be nested. All right. What do I mean by nested? Nested is like contained in. Another way to put it is that they're not going to overlap. So if a tag starts within a tag, it also ends within a tag. So for example, this title is part of the head section. Right? How do I know it's part of the head section? Well, it's between the start and end tag for the head section. In other words, this says this is where the head section starts. This says this is where the head section ends. So anything between there is part of the head section. All right. Well, the title is part of the head section, as we said before. That's, that's where you put the title. So the, because the, the title is part of the head section, it starts in the head section, and it ends in the head section. So the way I have it coded is correct. If I were to do this, That would be incorrect. All right. Why? Well, because the title started in the head section, but here's the end of the head section, and then you have the end title tag. So that's not proper nesting. All right. Now, what happens if you do this? You don't know. In this particular case, nothing really happened bad except the title has, shows the end head tag. It thinks the end head tag is part of the title. So it shows it up there. But the rest of the page displays correctly. It's that way with HTML. If you break the rules, it's going to take its best shot to figure out what you really mean. And it might do it correctly or it might do it incorrectly. In this case, it did it more or less correctly, but again, that end head tag was part of the title. So let's get it back to where, let's forget this end head tag. 
or and uh, and uh, H2 tag. And let's see what happens. Why did it do that? Did you notice what it did? It made that second paragraph bigger. Yeah, exactly. In other words, because we didn't specify where that ending H2 tag is, it thinks that everything after it is part of that H2. So it makes it bigger. Now, a different browser might handle that differently. All right. Chrome and Internet Explorer did it both the same way. All right. But it would be possible that you, if you broke the rule, that a different browser is liable to treat it a little bit differently. When you break the rule, sort of all bets are off. So, what we had before at the beginning of class is I had forgot the end title tag. And therefore, it thought everything was the title. All right? And didn't think anything was the body. So, tags come in pairs, starting and ending tag. They go around the stuff that belongs as part of them. They describe the kind of content it is. In other words, this H1 tag tells me that this text is meant to be a top level heading. This H2 tag tells me that it's meant to be a second level heading. This is a paragraph, this is a second level heading, this is another paragraph. Now, the browser has rules about how these things look. So, for example, H1s are typically the biggest headline, which makes sense, right? The most important heading should be the biggest. H2s are a little bit smaller, and so on down the line. Now, eventually, we're going to be able to control that via CSS. But, for now, um, our pages are going, to look the way, are going to look based on the rules of the browser, based on the standards of, the, of how browsers are meant to display HTML pages. And as long as you follow the rules, you should get a pretty consistent look between different browsers. Could be some slight variations, but it would be pretty consistent between the different browsers. Tags ought to be nested. And nested, again, means that tags are contained within tags. So a tag that starts within a tag needs to end within a tag. So in this case, the body tag goes around all of these tags. So each of these tags start and end within the body tag. This would not be proper nesting because this H2 starts in the body tag but it ends within the paragraph tag. It should end within the body tag. Now, you'll notice that I indented some things. The formatting and the indentation of the page is really just to help me keep the page organized, keep, help the developer keep the page organized, and make it easy to change stuff. The web browser doesn't care as long as you follow the tags correctly. All right? So as long as you have created the tags correctly, all of this could be on one line. We could get literally get rid of all these lines and just have one giant line with all the tags in it and the page would work. Yeah, wouldn't you love to grade our homework? Wouldn't I love to grade your homework that way? Exactly. All right? Uh, if I saw something like that, it would put me in a grouchy mood. And I'm not saying I would grade you worse, but it's probably better to have me in a good mood than a grouchy mood when I'm, when I'm grading stuff. The benefit comes to you as a developer. For example, if this were on one line and someone came in and said, you know, I want an extra paragraph. Didn't save it. Yeah. 
I want an extra paragraph here. I can very easily glance and see where that extra paragraph belongs. If, this, if things weren't indented correctly, um, it would be more difficult to determine. Um, and, 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 and it would be harder to change. Keep in mind that most software, including web pages, you know at some point there's going to need to be changes made to it. It's just inevitable. All right? Therefore, a lot of the practices that we do in web development and in other forms of software development are take that into account and try to make it easy to make any changes that we want to make to it. All right? So a lot, uh, a lot of the practices that we do, for example, in Denning, browser doesn't care about it. Why do we do it? Well, we may want to go back and, and make changes to it. And if we indent it, that will make it easier for us to tell that the nesting is correct. That will make it easier for us to tell where to put things if we need to add things. What this means is the browser effectively ignores any additional what's called white space. And what white space is are, are blank lines, um, extra spaces, and so on. And that seems confusing at first, but it's actually a good thing because this allows us to format our web pages in a way that's readable for us so that we can go back later and change them. So notice I'm putting a bunch of extra spaces here and a few extra blank lines and so on. Yet, when I display the page, it doesn't include those extra lines and extra spaces. And again, that gets me a little confusing at first. And sometimes beginning web students will try to put extra spaces in to get things to align correctly. That's not the way to align things. Again, the HTML contains the content of the page. Any of the formatting and the appearance of the page we're going to control via CSS. Yes? When I was a kid in grammar school, uh, we were taught to indent paragraphs. What would I do to indent a paragraph? <laughs> if I wanted to. First of all, First of all, um, there, there actually is um, discussion of if that practice is still considered appropriate or not. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, that is. That being said, um, you actually, there actually is CSS style uh, commands that allow you to do things, uh, do an indent on the first line of something. So it would allow you to do that. <coughs> Those would be different paragraphs then. Paragraphs. Yeah, different paragraphs, yeah. Or you can make a list, which we'll talk about um, in, in, a, in a second here. All right, we'll talk about the list tag. So if you want the title in the middle of the page, you can that. That's CSS. If I want that heading to be in the middle of the page, that's CSS. All right. You will hear me say 14,000 times throughout the rest of the semester, we have 14 more weeks. I'll do it 1,000 times a week. I will say that's something you do with CSS. So first week, I probably only do 500 times. But the rest of the weeks will be 1,000 each. <coughs> Again, content is HTML. The text, the images, the links, lists, all those things are HTML because that's the content of the page. The appearance and the layout of the page is going to be controlled through CSS. Now, why do you think that's important? Why, why, is, why, do, why am I so focused on that? What do you suppose, what do you think the advantages are of having content one place, layout in another place? You can, exactly, you can change the one without messing up the other. All right? And that's always a good thing, right? Remember. 
most of our good software development practices and web development practices are based on maintainability. So if I have a web page, or a website rather, that has 50 web pages on it, if I can have all my CSS code in one place, if I want to change the color scheme instead of being, you know, blue and white to being, you know, purple and white, I can make that change in one place and that change will be reflected throughout the site. So by having it separate, I can change one thing without affecting the other. That becomes even more important these days with mobile devices, right? Because in many cases, people are going to be visiting a website from a desktop computer or a laptop and they might be visiting it from a tablet, they might be visiting it from a phone. All right. The screen size for a desktop machine is, is much different than the screen size for a phone. So there's different rules and different things that you'd want to follow. Well, if you keep those things separate, guess what you can do? You can plug in a different style and get, have the same content. So I don't have to have two, a, a website for mobile and a website for, um, uh, you know, for desktops. I can have one set of content that gets applied different style sheets. And there we go. All right, let's look at a list tag now. And to continue with this theme, I'll put another H2. Let's say I want to have a list, a bulleted list of items. All right, there's, there's a tag for that. All right, and there's actually two kinds of lists that there's only one teeny difference in. One is called an unordered list and one is called an ordered list. An ordered list is where you're doing something like a ranking. Like, you know, here is, you know, here is the results of the downhill ski race in the Olympics, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's a ranking, right? They need to be in that order. The first person that's listed is the winner. That means something. As opposed to a list of maybe, here are the people that are going to be competing in the downhill race. Where, and maybe the order doesn't really matter so much. So one, the order really matters. One, the order doesn't matter so much. So, I'm going to use an unordered list to list some of my other classes that I teach. Because the order really doesn't matter. I'm just going to arbitrarily pick them in some order. It doesn't really matter the order I put them in. Now, notice one thing I did is when I put in the UL, I immediately put in the end UL tag. All right. UL stands for unordered list. An ordered list will be exactly like this, except it will be OL for ordered list. And the end tag will be end OL. Now, each list item, each item in the list is an LI tag. So, let's go back and revisit what I talked about before. Every start tag has an end tag. All right, so that's good. I've indented to show the nesting. In other words, these LIs are part of this list. So, I indented to show that. Not for the browser's purpose, but for my purpose. All right. And every start LI has an end LI tag. So, I've formed these properly. Again, well, we won't do that right now. So if I go and save it, 
and view it in the browser, I get a bulleted list of the items. Yes? Under what circumstances would the browser change the order from the order that you entered it into the, the code? Oh, no. It'll, it'll, it'll always put it in the order that you've entered the code. All right? It, so so it's, not, it's not the behavior of the browser. An unordered list doesn't tell the browser to do really anything different to sequencing it. It just tells the browser that, hey, this order is arbitrary. So don't put like numbers next to it. All right. Let me show you what I mean by making this an ordered list. Still use li. There's still list items. It's just that they're, they're items as part of an ordered list. We see one, two, three, four. All right. So this is more of a conceptual thing than a thing that the browser uh, is going to use for ordering. Unordered list means conceptually the order really doesn't matter. This is just the order that I happen to think of them in. As opposed to an ordered list is this is a specific listing and it has to be in this order for whatever reason. And it's going to get a number. And it's going to get a number. Unless you tell it in CSS. I'm glad you added that on there. Because all these things that I talk about, about the way it looks, these are all the browser defaults. We can overrule any of them based on CSS. So, for example, the default for an unordered list, let me change that back to unordered. The default for unordered list is that it'll be one item per line and there'll be a bullet point in front of it. All right? Now, you might not like that. You might not want all your lists to look that way. You might want your list to have something other than a bullet point in front of it. You might want your list not to be oriented vertically, but to be oriented horizontally. All right? Well, you can do that via CSS. Remember, your, the way your page looks depends on a combination of what the browser's sort of natural behavior is, default behavior, and what you do in CSS. Questions? All right. Next tag we're going to cover is a link. What would web pages be without links? All right. You know, probably isn't a web page in the world that doesn't have a link to somewhere. If it did, that would be the end of the internet, right? Because you'd hit it and you'd you'd have to go and go for a walk or something because there'd be no place to go from there. All right. So links are important. And again, really, it's, it's a big part of the hypertext. That's the big advantage of, of HTML documents. All right? Think about when HTML was originally developed. It was originally developed by scientists at the Nuclear Research Facility in, in um, Geneva, CERN. It's called C-E-R-N. <laughs> And what they wanted to do is they wanted to reference their papers. So like if a scientist wrote a paper about some topic and quoted another paper, what would you have to do back in the old days? In the old days, you'd have to like write down the name of the paper and the author and go to the library and look that up and so on. The vision of the person that, uh, um, that, that envisioned the web was to say, well, hey, you know, we got computers here. We should be able to link these documents together. So instead of me writing down the name of the author in the paper and going to the library and trying to find it, I should be able to click on the text and see the paper directly. So that's a big part from, from the word go of, of hypertext. So let's go in and let's create a link to Lorraine Community College's web page on this page. Notice what I'm doing. I have both those views open at the same time. I'm viewing, again, not two files. There's only one HTML file. But I'm viewing it in the browser, and I'm viewing it in Notepad. I'm making the changes in Notepad, saving it, then hitting refresh to, to see the results in the browser. So I'll go in and I'll put a paragraph here, and I'll say, 
I am Mike Zellers. I teach at Lorain County Community College. Now, ideally, I would want those words, Lorain County Community College, to be a link to Lorain Community's website. All right? So how do I do that? I do that with a tag. How do you do anything in HTML? How do you distinguish any kind of content? How do you make something a headline or a paragraph or a list item? You do it with a tag. That's how you do anything in HTML is that there's a tag for it. The tag for links is the A tag. And there's a start and ending tag. But if I look at this, it looks like there's something missing, right? What seems to be missing from what I have up there? Oh, yeah, I, I am missing an end paragraph tag. That's correct. But I meant specifically relating to the link. Yeah. What is the, what is Loyne Community College's website? You know, um, it's not enough to say I have a link, right? I have to say a link to such and such page, right? So with a link tag, with the a tag we have to supply a little bit extra information. For example, you know, just think in, in everyday terms. If I, were, if, I, if I were to tell someone, you know, if someone said their car broke down, they need a ride home. And I says, okay, fine, meet me at my car. All right? Well, that's not enough information for them, right? You know, which car? There's thousands of cars. There's cars in that parking lot, cars in that parking lot. No idea. All right? That's sort of the same thing we the situation we have here. I want to make a link to a web page. Well, which web page? There's, there's billions of them. That's when we have to supply extra information with the tag. And that's not done through a tag. That's done through what is called an attribute. All right? An attribute is extra information about a tag. So, for example, if I were to tell you to meet me at my car, I might give you some characteristics of my car. Well, it is blue. It's a Scion. Its license plate number is such and such. All right? I might give you extra information. That would help you find my car. All right? Out of all the cars that are parked out there. Same thing here. We have to give the tag extra information to say what is the web page that we do want to link to. And that is done through an attribute. And attributes appear as part of the start tag. So they're not a new tag. They're part of the start tag. And each attribute has a name and a value. So, the name of the page that we're going to is the href attribute. href equals, and we put in http colon slash slash lorraineccc.edu. All attributes are going to look like this. They're going to be something equals something. And that something is going to be enclosed in quotes. Something equals something. And it just matters what tag, what the list of available attributes are. For a link, the attribute that says what page we want to go to is the href tag. So we say href equals, and then we put in quotes, the address of the page. You do need the HTTP in front of it. We'll talk about probably 
Tuesday, why you need it, what happens if you don't put it in, and so on. Usually what I do if I want to link to a particular page is I'll pull that page up in the browser and I'll simply copy the link and then paste it in there. So if I wanted to link maybe to this page instead, I would copy the URL and get the exact name of it to make sure it's correct. H href stands for hypertext reference. It's like an A stands for anchor. I don't make these up. All right, so now if we look at it, and view it. I'm Mike Zellers. I teach at Lorain County Community College. Notice that Lorain County Community College looks different than the rest of the text. Why? Well, because we tagged it as a link. All right. Where did we tell it to make it blue and underlined? We didn't. That's the browser's default behavior. By default, the browser makes links blue and underlined. Can we change that? Absolutely we can change that with CSS. Okay. So we click on that and there we go. We're linked to that page. So it, it takes you to that page. Does not open a new page, correct. New page. That actually is a big controversy, not a big controversy, but, but that's, that's, a, that's a, a discussion uh, among web developers of, of what to do. A lot of web developers say it's best to always open the page in the same window and not open a new window because that takes the control out of the user's hand. If I want to open it in a new window, I can do that simply by right mousing on it and saying open in a new tab or open a new window. All right. I just noticed that some web pages will open it. Some will do it, yeah. Actually, the way to do that Maybe is uh, the way to do that is you can say target equals underscore blank. and then it will open it in a new window. No, that depending on browser settings, the browser can be set that if it tries to open a new window to open a new tab instead. <laughs> uh, if I remember right anyhow. Generally speaking, you avoid using that target. I don't know why I mentioned it. I guess just for purposes of completeness. The idea is, 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 you know, is best not to go ahead and open up new windows on the user's machine. If they are savvy enough where they want to open it up in a new tab, they can always, via right mousing on it, open it up in a new tab or a new window. This is the first case, again, where we see that a tag has an attribute associated with it. But we'll see other examples as well. All right. When we get the images, we say we want to display an image. Well, which image? All right. A website could have a bunch of images. Which image do I want to show right here and now? Well, we have to specify the name of the image that we want to show. So anytime when you have additional information that you want to um, say about a tag, um, is typically done through an attribute. And all the attributes will look the same. They're part of the start tag. They're not a tag by themselves. That's a common mistake students make is they'll like, m try to make that a tag by itself. You don't need them at the start and end. They're just part of the start tag. 
And they're always the name of the attribute equals and then some value, depending on the value. Now, what if I wanted to link not to a page out on the internet, but another page that I created? All right, that's on my web server. Web pages, when they're completed, get put on a web server. And what a web server is, is it's a computer system that can accept requests for web pages and, and deliver web pages. So, in this case, the link went from my web page to Loin Community's site. So it went to a different web server. It went from my machine to that. What if I had another page on my site that I wanted to go to? How would I create a link for that? And the way you create a link for that is as follows. I'm going to go real quick and I'm going to make a second page. Again, I'm going to save it as all files. I'm going to put in second.html. And I'm not going to put much on this page. I just want a second page. So let's go and save that. Here it is. All right. So how do I create a link from this first page to the second page? Let's go and open the first page again in Notepad. Say I want to make a link to that second page. Well, we've seen the tag to create a link. So we know it's that. We know the name of the web page is going to be href equals. All right. Because this is my page that's going to be on my web server, I don't need to put in that full HTTP colon LorraineCCC.edu assuming that these files are in the same folder as each other, which in my case they are. They're both on the desktop. I only have to put in the name of the second page. So I don't have to put in HTTP www. It's on the same web server as I'm on. Or it will be on the same web server that I'm on. It's in the same folder. If that's the case, you only have to specify the name of the file. Now, you do not want anything that looks like, and I'll get students occasionally that will turn in things like this, where it will say C colon backslash uh, user slash John Doe slash desktop slash whatever. That will only work on your machine. When I copy it to my machine and run it, given the fact that usually I'm grading these things on a Mac, I don't have a C drive. So that's not going to work. And I don't have a folder or a username that matches your name on my machine. So therefore, this is what's called the relative path to a page. In other words, I'm in the same folder, this is the name of the page, so you only need to put the name of the page. So now we can go and save this. And we have a link from our second page, or I'm sorry, from our first page to the second page. Right. 
Yeah. There we go. And there's our second page. For good measure, we could put a page, we probably should put a page link back to the first page. I think Internet Explorer was taking its good old time. I think it was going to work, but... I do not know. Yeah, this is this this isn't even an HTML5 thing though. This is I, I, I have to confess Internet Explorer simply looks like it's not responding at all. I don't know. Not sure why Internet Explorer is having an issue with this. Now, as far as HTML goes, we got tags, we got attributes, we got nesting, we have starting and ending. In concept, that's pretty much it for HTML tags. We just got to learn more of them. We got to learn HTML tags for images and and uh, and for sections of our page, so that we can we can create little sections for our page and so on and so forth. And that'll come, um, you know, starting next week. But in concept, the fact that you have tags, the fact that you have starting and ending tags, the fact that you have attributes, the fact that tags are nested, all those things are the basics of tags, and we're simply going to expand on them throughout the semester. Any questions at this point? All right, we'll see you over in lab.